A very good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis. Now today is the last day that you are going to receive the Hindu newspaper analysis from our side. Now do not panic, we have an alternative plan. You are going to pick up 50 to 55 questions from the previous months and we are going to compile it and give it to you for your preliminary exam revision. You will get weekly once video. Okay? So, with this happy note, let us get into the newspaper analysis. Today's date is 28th of March 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So, without much delay, let us get into the first news article discussion. Look at this editorial article. It talks about the growing significance of the blue economy. The author believes that as India is holding the G20 presidency now, India can play an important role in facilitating the transition towards a sustainable blue economy. So in this context, let us understand the points discussed in the article more elaborately. This discussion would fall under this part of the syllabus. Kindly go through it. Now, first we will try to understand the blue economy and what is the significance of the blue economy. See, according to the World Bank, the blue economy is defined as sustainable development of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs while preserving the health of the ocean ecosystem. And it includes all these activities like generating marine energy, sustainable tourism, sustainable fisheries, international trade through maritime transport, waste management, etc. Then most importantly, by managing our marine resources, we could combat climate change impacts. This is because oceans are highly impacted by extreme weather events, changing ocean current patterns, ocean acidification and sea level rise. So what are the significance of blue economy? See every dollar invested in key ocean activities yield 5 times that is 5 dollar in return according to a recent research. It is no wonder we all know that the most prosperous cities and countries are endowed with the coast. Cities which are landlocked are considered to be in a disadvantageous position because oceans are a treasure of opportunities. Also, oceans are reservoirs of global biodiversity. They are critical regulators of the global weather and climate. Apart from these, oceans also support the economic well-being of billions of people in coastal areas. But the blue economy is not only about ocean dependent economic development, it also means inclusive social development and environmental and ecological security. Okay? Recognizing the importance of the blue economy, India has taken a host of initiatives to promote the development of blue economy. We will see what are those initiatives now. Firstly, the author mentions about the Sahar Mala project. See, the Sahar Mala project has been initiated by the government of India in 2015 to promote port-led development in India. One of the major components of the project is port modernization and new port development. The project mainly aims to cut down logistics cost of exports and import by developing world-class ports. Okay. Secondly, we have the shipbuilding financial assistance policy to encourage domestic shipbuilding. Here, financial assistance is being granted to Indian shipyards on the contract price received for each vessel built by them. Okay. Thirdly, Pradhan Mantri Matsya Sampata Yojana. It is a flagship scheme for focused and sustainable development of the fisheries sector in the country. It aims to enhance fish production by an additional 70 lakh ton and to increase fisheries export earnings. Then it also has a profound goal of doubling the income of fishermen and fish farmers. Then the recently launched Sahar Mantan dashboard by the Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways, which is in short called as MOPSW. This new digital platform has all the integrated data related to the ministry and other subsidiaries. The dashboard will provide well-coordinated real-time information on the working of different departments. It can even track vessels in real-time. Then there is the deep ocean mission. It aims to explore the marine diversity in our country which is still unexplored. 
Now that this ambitious project is managed by the Ministry of Earth Sciences. The main focus is on studying and exploring the deep water bodies in order to get an idea about the undiscovered minerals, stones, living or non-living entities. Then India adopted the Coastal Regulation Zone notification to clarify and better manage coastal regions. Then in 2022, through the plastic waste management rules, India banned the use of single-use plastic which often ends up in oceans and pollutes them. Finally, under India's T20 presidency, the blue economy is a priority area under the Environment and Climate Sustainability Working Group. The aim is to promote adoption of high-level principles that guide sustainable and equitable economic development through the marine resources. This can be done when we simultaneously address climate change and other environmental challenges related to oceans. So these are all some of the measures taken by India. Apart from this, G20 has also been working to safeguard the oceans and has taken up many ocean related issues so far. These include the G20 Action Plan on Marine Litter, the Osaka Blue Ocean Vision and the Coral Research and Development Accelerated Platform. Now, India is also committed to prioritize oceans and the blue economy under its presidency. So, this would ensure continued discussions on this crucial subject. Now, what are the challenges in the development of blue economy? See, we all know that ocean are interconnected. This means that activities occurring in one part of the world could have ripple effect across the globe. Therefore, the responsibility of their protection, conservation and sustainable utilization lies with all nations. But unfortunately, it involves quite a lot of stakeholders like there are businesses, there are environmentalists, there are coastal communities like fishermen and all these groups have differing interests. So it is a big challenge to bring all the participants on one stage. This is one of the challenges. Then the ocean itself is facing so many threats like marine pollution, over extraction of resources and unplanned urbanization. This may affect the ocean, coastal and marine ecosystems and biodiversity. Without a sustainable marine resource management, developing blue economy is not possible. So finally, the author says that India's G20 presidency would play an important role in promoting individual and collective actions, thereby facilitating the transition towards a sustainable blue economy. This is because G20 is an excellent forum to build an effective communication with all stakeholders. So the first challenge could be sorted out here. Every stakeholder can share best practices, then the members can also foster collaborations for advancements in science and technology. Then the member countries can work on public-private partnerships and to create novel blue finance mechanisms. That's all regarding this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about the blue economy, steps taken by Indian government to safeguard the blue economy and the challenges faced by the blue economy and how it can be rectified using India's G20 presidency. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this article here. According to the article, Supreme Court asked the Solicitor General to provide an updated position of the bills pending with Telangana Governor Tamilisai Saundarajan. This is because several bills passed by the assembly are pending. So the state has blamed the governor for creating a constitutional impasse by refusing to act on several bills passed by the legislature. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us revise about the veto powers of governor and compare it with the veto power of president. First, we will see what is veto power. See, it is the power or right vested in one branch of a government to cancel or postpone the decision or enactment of another branch. In Indian context, it denotes the right of a president and a governor to reject bills passed by the legislature. Okay? Know that there are three types of veto powers. First one is absolute veto. Second one is suspensive veto. And the last one is pocket veto. Absolute veto means the power to withhold the assent to the bill. 
suspensive veto means it gives the power to return the bill to the legislature for reconsideration then pocket veto means it is the power to not act upon a bill okay now let us see the veto powers of governor in indian constitution article 200 and 201 governs the veto power of governor now let us see about them see when a bill is presented to the governor for his assent four cases are possible firstly he can give his assent to the bill after the assent the bill becomes an act secondly he can withhold the assent to the bill this is absolute veto thirdly he can return the bill to the state legislature for reconsideration here you should know two things one is governor cannot return a money bill and the other one is if the bill is passed again by the legislature with or without any amendments now governor cannot withhold his assent so here government only enjoys suspensive veto now lastly he cannot withhold his assent after the bill is passed again by the legislature but he can reserve the bill for the consideration of the president this is only article 201 okay clearly understand the difference between the both so these are the four cases possible while giving assent to an ordinary bill this is about the veto powers of governor now let us compare it with president president's veto power are governed by article 111 See with respect to ordinary bill president has three options firstly she can give assent to the bill secondly she can withhold the assent that is absolute veto and thirdly she can return the bill for reconsideration of the house here like governor president also enjoys only suspensive veto this is because if the bill is passed again with or without any amendments by the houses then president cannot withhold her assent here also president cannot return a money bill important point here is that if the governor reserves a state money bill for the consideration of the president then also she cannot return the state money bill okay another important point here is let us say governor has reserved a bill and it is not a money bill now president is returning the bill for the reconsideration of the state legislature and the bill is passed again with or without amendment and sent to the president in this case president is not bound to give his assent okay so to sum up when a bill is returned to the state legislature for reconsideration and if the bill is passed again by the legislature with or without any amendments the governor cannot withhold his assent but he can reserve the bill for the consideration of the president but on the other hand if the president is returning the bill for the consideration of the state legislature and the bill is passed again with or without the amendment and sent to president in this case president is not bound to give his assent okay it is a little bit confusing but upsc might ask tricky questions in these areas that is why we picked up this news article so with these learned points let us move on to the next news article discussion For our next discussion we will take up this news article from foreign page it says that israeli prime minister announced a delay in his judicial overhaul plan the centerpiece of the overhaul is a law that would give the governing coalition the final say over all judicial appointments this is about the news article given here see here judicial overhaul plan is not much relevant to our examination so today let us restrict ourselves to see about the location of israel since israel and palestine is always in news there might be a map based question with respect to israel that is why we are going to revise about the location of israel in this discussion okay now look at this map given here it is the political map of israel as you can see the important regions include gaza strip west bank golan heights we all know the history of israel independence right so there is a constant fight between palestine arabs and israeli jews this map here shows how the palestine's arabs population declined over the years now it is confined to only the gaza strip and west bank now talking about israel israel is a small country in the middle east The country has a diverse climate with snowy mountains in the north and the hot desert in the south. The Negev desert in southern Israel receives only 1 inch that is 32 mm of rain a year. In the north, Galilee is known to have the most fertile farmland in the country. 
now coming to the location of it as i already said it is a country in middle east it is bordered by lebanon to the north syria and jordan to the east egypt to the south israeli is connected to mediterranean sea red sea here you can see that it is connected to red sea through gulf of aqaba finally before concluding let us see about the physical geography of israel the four major physical features of israel include first is mediterranean coastal plains then central hill region it includes upper and lower galilee then jordan rift valley region and finally is negev region okay some of other important features include lake kinneret which is also called as sea of galilee it is located between the hill of galilee and the golan heights it is israel's largest lake and serves as the country's main water reservoir next is jordan river it flows from north to south through the rift it empties into the dead sea now the third important feature is the dead sea it is the lowest point on the earth at about 1300 feet below sea level okay dead sea's water is rich in potash magnesium and bromine so it is the highest level of salinity and density in the world we know that right so that's all regarding the location of israel there might be a question regarding israel so just make note of it and revise it once before the examination okay so these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion this news article informs us about a statement made by our finance minister in lok sabha in her statement our finance minister mentioned that 54 foreign direct investment that is fdi proposals with investors from china and hong kong are pending before the government this she mentioned is due to the government amended fdi policy according to the amended fdi policy of the government for investments arising from countries that share land borders with india a government route is the only option so this is about the news article given here in this context let us quickly revise fdi and fpi okay first let us take fpi fpi or foreign portfolio investment refers to passive investments in the financial assets of a foreign economy here financial assets include stocks bonds and securities the fbi has some characteristics associated with it first one is they invest only in financial assets and not physical assets like buildings and protection units second one is fbi are not involved in the day to day operations of the companies they invest in the third one is the main motive behind the fbi is to generate short term financial gains the fbi are not focused on gaining managerial operations of the business so the investment through fpi or very volatile okay now let us take up fdi or foreign direct investment see in the case of fdi a company invest in foreign companies with the intention of taking control of the ownership and by participating in the company's day to day business in case of fdi the focus is not just on the financial assets but also the physical assets for example walmart acquired 77 percentage stake in flipkart for 16 billion dollars it is a very good example of fdi okay now let us see some of the features of fdi first one is like i already mentioned fdi is aimed at taking over the day to day management of the company second one is in the case of fdi there is transfer of technology and knowledge which does not happen in case of fpi the last one is that fdi is more stable when compared to fpi this is because the focus of fdi is not on short term gains so these are the characteristics of fdi this we came to the end of this new article discussion in this new article discussion we saw about the difference between fdi and fpi So these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this news article the news article is about the response of our union minister for fisheries animal husbandry and dairying to a question raised by a tamil nadu mp in rajesh sabha the union minister replied to the question by providing some data on funds allocated for schemes in tamil nadu this is about the news article given here In this context let us discuss about the financial relationship between the center and the state 
See, part 12 of the Indian Constitution deals with finance, property, contracts and suits. In part 12, article 268 to 293 deals with the financial relations between the center and the state. Let us first take article 268. Article 268 deals with the taxes levied by the union but collected and appropriated by the states. Article 268 mainly deals with the stamp duties mentioned in the union list. For example, the stamp duties on bills of exchange, checks, promissory notes, letters of credit, policies of insurance and transfer of shares, the tax is levied by the union government but the state government collects the tax and keep it as a part of its own consolidated fund. In case of the union territories, the union government levies the tax, collects the tax and appropriates the tax. Moving on to Article 269, Article 269 deals with taxes levied and collected by the union but assigned to the states. This includes taxes on the sales and purchase of goods in interstate trade or commerce. Only items that is excluded here is newspaper. In case of Article 269, the union government levies and collects the tax. The collector tax is then assigned to the states. Okay. Next is Article 269A. Article 269A was inserted by the 101st Constitutional Amendment. And we know that the 101st Constitutional Amendment was introduced to implement the GST regime. Article 269A deals with the tax on goods and services in case of interstate commerce and trade. Taxes under Article 269A are levied and collected by the union. The collected tax is then appropriated between the union and the states. The way the collected tax is to be appropriated between the union and the state is decided by the GST council from time to time. Okay? Note here that Article 269 mainly deals with tax on interstate trade in goods and 269A deals with tax on interstate trade and commerce of goods and services. Moving on to Article 270, Article 270 deals with the taxes that are levied and collected by the union and distributed between the union and the states. Tax under Article 270 includes all the taxes mentioned in the union list except for the taxes and duties mentioned in the Article 268, 269 and 269A in addition to the cess and surcharge. Okay? Article 270 includes tax like income tax and corporation tax. Here note that the manner of distribution of net proceeds of these taxes is prescribed by the President on the recommendation of the Finance Commission. Then we have Article 271. Article 271 deals with surcharge of the union. The proceedings of the surcharge will be part of the Consolidated Fund of India. Then there is Article 279A. Article 279A deals with the GST Council. This article was also added to the Constitution through the 101st Constitution Amendment. As per Article 279A, the Council is chaired by the Union Finance Minister. Its members include the Union State Minister of Revenue or Finance and Ministers in Charge of Finance or Taxation of all the states. The GST Council makes recommendation to the Union and states on these issues. Firstly, it can make recommendations on the taxes, cesses and surcharge that are levied by the union, states and local bodies which may be subsumed under GST. Then it makes recommendations on the goods and services that may be subjected to or exempted from the GST. Then it will recommend the principles of levy, allocation of integrated GST that is IGST. Next, the GST council recommends the limit below which GST will be exempted. Finally, it makes recommendations on any special rate or rates for a specific period. This is done to raise additional resources during any natural calamity or disaster. So this is about Article 279A and the GST Council. See, a discussion about the financial relation between the union and the state is not complete without mentioning the Finance Commission. And Article 280 deals with the Finance Commission. According to Article 280, the Finance Commission is constituted by the President every five years. It is a quasi-judicial body. The main purpose of the body is to give recommendations on distribution of tax revenues like how the distribution should be made between the union and amongst the states themselves. 
द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बेसिकली डिटमाइंस द मेथड एंड फॉर्मूला फॉर डिस्ट्रीब्यूटिंग द टैक्स प्रोसीड्स बिटवीन द सेंटर एंड द स्टेट्स द फिनेंस कमीशन ऑल्सो डिसाइड्स द शेयर ऑफ टैक्सेस एंड ग्रांट्स टू बी गिवन टू द लोकल बॉडीज इन द स्टेट्स नो रिमेंबर द फिनेंस कमीशन हैज अ चेयरमैन एंड फोर मेंबर्स अपॉइंटेड बाय द प्रेसिडेंट सिंस दे आर अपॉइंटेड बाय द प्रेसिडेंट दे सर्व फॉर द लेंथ ऑफ टाइम इंडिकेटेड बाय द प्रेसिडेंट इन हिज ऑर्डर द मेंबर्स ऑफ द फिनेंस कमीशन आर एलिजिबल फॉर अपॉइंटमेंट द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया प्रोवाइड्स अ नेसेसरी सपोर्ट एंड मैन पावर इंक्लूडिंग अ सेक्रेटरी टू द कमीशन टू फैसिलिटेट इट्स वर्क्स These are some basic points about Finance Commission and Article 280. That's all regarding this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we focused mainly on financial relations between the union and the states, and we also saw the various constitutional provisions that govern the financial relation between the union and the states. So, with these learnt points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this article given here. Yesterday, the Loka Yukta Police arrested a BJP MLA of Karnataka. He was arrested after his anticipatory bail was dismissed by the Karnataka High Court. According to Loka Yukta, the MLA had demanded 81 lakh rupees bribe to pass a bill, and the MLA's son was caught in his office while accepting 40 lakh rupees out of 81 lakhs. This is why the MLA got arrested by the Loka Yukta Police. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us understand the difference between the Lokpal and Loka Yukta. Now, let's start with the formation of Lokpal and Loka Yukta. See, first of all, know that both Lokpal and Loka Yukta were established under the Lokpal and Loka Yukta Act, 2013. So, both of them are statutory body, and since they don't have any constitutional status, they are non-constitutional bodies. Okay. Now, talking about the mandate, both Lokpal and Loka Yuktas are mandated to inquire into allegation of corruption charges that are made against public functionaries. Here, the term public functionaries means that the person who are falling within the ambit of the Lokpal and Loka Yukta Act 2013. Now, particularly talking about Lokpal, Lokpal was established at the union level. it enquires into allegations of corruption charges that were made against former and current central government executives and employees they include the prime minister union government ministers members of parliament group a b c and d officers and other officials of the union government so you can even raise a complaint about prime minister in lokpal apart from this functionaries of any body corporate society trust or autonomous body that was established by an act of parliament or wholly or partly funded by union or state government they are also covered under the ambit of lokpal in addition to this lokpal also covers any society or trust or body that receives foreign contribution above 10 lakh rupees now coming to lok ayukta lok ayukta were established at the state level to enquire into allegations of corruption charges that are made against former and current state government executives and employees the jurisdiction of lok ayukta is not the same in all states in some states apart from state government officials the cm and state ministers were also brought under the ambit of lok ayukta that is in some states the cm and ministers were excluded from the ambit of lok ayukta now moving on to see about the membership let's start with lokpal the lokpal consists of a chairperson and not more than 8 members talking about the qualification of the chairman chairman shall be the present or former chief justice of india or the present or former judge of the supreme court or an eminent person with integrity and outstanding ability and he or she must possess special knowledge and a minimum experience of 25 years in matters relating to anti corruption policy public administration vigilance finance including insurance and banking then law and management so this is about the qualification of chairman of lokpal Now talking about the qualification of the members see 50 percentage out of the total members shall be judicial members the judicial members must be either a former judge of the supreme court or a former chief justice of the high court the remaining 50 percentage have to fulfill the eligibility conditions same as an eminent person which i mentioned earlier okay also know that at least half of the lokpal members must be from scheduled caste 
scheduled tribes, other backward classes, minorities and women. This is all about the membership of Lokpal. Now coming to Lokayakta, as I mentioned earlier, Lokayakta were established at the state level. The structure of Lokayaktas is not the same in all the states. Some states have created only Lokayakta, whereas some states have created both Lokayakta and Upalokayaktas. Apart from this, some states have designated some officials as Lokayakta. So the structure is not the same in all the states. Note that in some states, the Lokayukta would consist of chairperson and some members. So this is all about the membership. Now moving on to say about the appointment of the members. In Lokpal, the chairperson and the members are appointed by the president on the recommendation of a select committee. The select committee consists of the chairperson and some other members. They include the prime minister who act as the chairperson of the select committee. Then the members include the speaker of Lok Sabha, leader of opposition in the Lok Sabha or the leader of single large opposition party in the Lok Sabha, chief justice of India or a judge of a Supreme Court nominated by CJI, one eminent jurist. Now talking about the appointment of Lokayakta members, as I said earlier, the structure of Lokayakta is not the same in all the states. In case if the states is having Lokayakta, the chairperson and members are appointed by the governor of the respective state. The members are appointed based on the recommendation of a select committee. The select committee consists of the chief minister as the chairperson and the other members includes the speaker and leader of opposition in the legislative assembly. For states that have a legislative council, the select committee should also include the chairman and the leader of opposition in the legislative council. Note that while selection, the chief minister has to consult with the chief justice of the high court. Okay. That's all regarding this news article discussion. In this news article discussion, we saw in detail about Lokayakta and Lokpal and we saw the difference between both the bodies. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news article. According to the news article, the Securities Exchange Board of India, that is SEBI, has been given responsibility by the government for overseeing the actions of market index providers. This step has been taken due to the worries about the security of savings held by passive investors in funds linked to indices that have added or kept a number of Adani group stocks. Okay. Now the issue here is not relevant to our examination. Instead, let us revise basic facts about SEBI. See, the Securities and Exchange Board of India was constituted as a non-statutory body on April 12, 1988 through a resolution of the Government of India. In the year 1992, SEBI was established as a statutory body. Okay, so at the beginning itself, it is not a statutory body. Later, it became a statutory body by enacting of Securities and Exchange Board of India Act 1992. Okay, now why was it established? Firstly, SEBI was introduced to develop transparency in the Indian stock market. Secondly, to protect the interest of investors, issuers of securities and other market participants. To protect them, SEBI is provided with the authority to check the account books of stock exchanges and audit the books of market intermediaries like companies, banks and registered brokers. So this is why SEBI was introduced. And these are the objectives of SEBI. Now talking about its structure, SEBI consists of nine members, a chairman who is selected by the union government, then two representatives from the union finance ministry, one representative from the RBI and the remaining five members are selected by the union government of India. So with this information, now let us see the powers of SEBI. See, SEBI has three key powers in stock market. They are legislative power, executive power and judicial power. Now let us see them one by one. Firstly, let us see the powers of SEBI as quasi-judicial body. See, as a quasi-judicial body, it has the authority to deliver judgments related to fraud and unfair activities. Secondly, as a quasi-executive body, SEBI executes rules and regulations to safeguard the interest of investors. Now thirdly, as a quasi-legislative body, SEBI has rights to frame guidelines like trading guidelines, disclosure requirements and listing obligations etc. So these are the powers of SEBI. Now finally, before concluding our discussion, let us see some of the functions of SEBI. 
Firstly, it encourages the development of the stock market and controls the market activities. Secondly, it offers a platform for investment advisors, portfolio managers, merchant bankers, underwriters, bankers and other associated participants. Thirdly, it regulates the working of depositories and foreign portfolio investors. Fourthly, it prevents insiders trading and any unfair trade practices in the stock market. Fifthly, it prohibits price manipulation of stocks in the securities market. Sixthly, it updates investors about various cautions through media. They also educate investors by conducting online and offline classes to provide market insights. Now finally, SEBI regulates the merger and acquisition of companies. So these are all some of the important facts that you have to remember about SEBI. With these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. It says that some prominent Muslim leaders and intellectuals have written a letter to the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, that is RSS. The letter was written to inform the organization that there have been continued instances of hate speech against the minority community. So in this context, let us use this opportunity to learn about hate speech laws in India. First of all, what is hate speech? According to 267, the report of the Law Commission of India, hate speech is stated as an incitement to hatred primarily against a group of people defined in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious belief and the like. So hate speech is any word written or spoken signs or visible representations that have the intention to incite violence. Now in India we have some provisions to curtail the hate speech. Firstly, hate speech can be curtailed under Article 19 Clause 2 on the grounds of public order, incitement to offence and security of the state. Then we have some sections in the IPC to punish hate speech. First is Section 295A of the IPC. It lays down the punishment for the deliberate and malicious acts that are intended to outrage religious feelings of any class by insulting its religion or religious beliefs. So this is one of the hate speech laws in India. This law prohibits blasphemy against all religions in India. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is a speech crime and religious crime. It is usually defined as an act that disrespects or insults a deity or disrespects the sacred belief of a religious community. Then we have section 153A. Under this section, promotion of enmity between different groups on grounds of religion, race, place of birth, residence, language, etc. and doing acts prejudicial to maintenance of harmony is an offence punishable with three years imprisonment. Know that it attracts a five year term if the action is committed in a place of worship or in an assembly engaged in religious worship or religious ceremonies. Then we have section 505. Here there are two subsections. Section 5051 and 5052. Under section 5051, the statement, publication, report or rumor that is penalized should be the one that promotes mutiny by the armed force that is it causes the armed forces to rebel against the state or causes such fear or alarm among the people so that the people are induced to commit an offense against the state or an action which is intended to incite any class or community to commit an offense against another class or community that is when an action of a person incites community a to exhibit violence against community b so this attracts a jail term of up to three years then under article 505 clause 2 it is an offense to make statements creating or promoting enmity hatred or ill will between classes and under subsection 3 the same offense will attract up to a five year jail term if the offense takes place in a place of worship or in any assembly engaged in religious worship or religious ceremonies so these are the main provisions against hate speech in India. 
make a note of all these you can use it in your main answer so with these we came to the end of this news article discussion in this news article discussion we saw in detail about the provisions against hate speech so these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion now look at this first question this question is about fdi statement 1 fdi helps bring better management skills and technology statement 2 fdi is considered to be more stable and statement 3 fdi's focus is mainly in the financial assets see here both the first statement and second statement is actually correct as we saw in the discussion fdi helps bring better management skills and technology and it is also more stable than fbi so the first and second statement are right but the third statement is incorrect here in case of FDI the focus is not just on the financial assets but also the physical assets and taking over the day to day operation so here the correct answer for the question is option A 1 and 2 only because the third statement is incorrect here moving on this question is about hate speech statement 1 representation of people's act 1951 RPA prevents a person convicted of the illegal use of the freedom of speech from contesting an election this statement is actually correct second statement in shreya singhal versus union of india case supreme court upheld section 66a of the information technology act 2000 relating to restrictions on online speech actually this statement is incorrect in shreya singhal versus union of india case the supreme court struck down section 66a of the information technology act 2000 relating to restriction on online speech as unconstitutional on grounds of violating the freedom of speech guaranteed under article 19 clause 1a of the constitution of india so the correct answer for the question is option a one only now moving on two statements are given you have to find the incorrect statement here statement 1 gulf of eilat connects israel with red sea this statement is actually correct look at the map gulf of aqaba only is called as gulf of eilat so this statement is correct statement 2 dead sea is bordered by israel syria and jordan see this statement is actually incorrect you can see the map here dead sea is wedged between jordan and israel syria is nowhere near dead sea so the correct answer for the question is option b 2 only okay Now moving on this question is about Lokpal and Lokayukta statement 1 the act states that all public officials need to furnish assets and liability of their own as well as their respective dependents this statement is actually correct as per Lokpal and Lokayukta act all public officials need to furnish their own assets and liabilities as well as their respective dependents statement 2 as per the act the lokpal possesses the power to superintendence over the cbi this statement is also correct as per the act the lokpal possesses the power to superintendence over the cbi it also has the authority to give directions to the cbi if a case is referred to cbi by the lokpal then the investigating officer in such a case cannot be transferred without the prior approval of the lokpal also the powers of a civil court has been vested with the inquiring wing of the lokpal okay so this statement is actually correct now look at this third statement as per the act the lokpal cannot have the power to confiscate assets proceeds and benefits arisen out of corruption see this statement is technically and logically incorrect okay the lokpal possesses power regarding the confiscation of assets proceeds receipts and benefits arisen or procured by means of corruption in special circumstances it also has the power to make recommendations regarding the transfer or suspension of public servants connected with the allegation of corruption okay so here since the question is asking for the correct statement the correct answer for the question is option a 1 and 2 only because third statement is incorrect here now moving on this question is about veto power statement 1 president cannot reject or return a constitutional amendment bill so this statement is actually correct the president must give his assent to the constitution amendment bill he can neither withhold his assent to the bill nor return the bill for reconsideration of the bill 
Now the second statement says that government cannot return a money bill to the state legislature for reconsideration but president can return a state money bill to the state legislature which has been reserved by the governor for the consideration of the president. This statement is incorrect. This we saw in the discussion itself right. President cannot return state money bill for reconsideration. So the question displayed here about the SEBI is the quiz question for you today. Just go through the question, try to answer it in the comment section. Now the questions displayed here are the main practice questions for you today. Just go through the question, try to write an answer and post it in the comment section. With this we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video, hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy. Now thank you for listening.